Hey everyone, thanks so much for joining us today for this On One Photo Raw 2022 premiere event where we dive into the new features of Photo Raw from A to Z. I'm Dylan Kotecki, I'm one of the software and video educators here at On One, and I'm joined by Dan. Hi, I'm Dan Harlicker, I'm the VP of product here at On One. And today we want to show you all of the new features inside of Photo Raw, and we also want to answer any questions that you have for us. So during this premiere event, if you want to ask questions, feel free to open up that Q&A dialogue and ask away and we'll be here to answer any of those questions for you. All right, so let's dive in right away and we're gonna go straight in to No Noise. Now, a lot of you have seen No Noise. There's been a lot of information in the media about it. It's our brand new AI-based noise reduction tool. It actually starts at the deep, raw information in your raw photos and can develop them, debear them, and reduce all the noise in one step. It's absolutely amazing. And now it's built into Photo Raw 2022. Let me show you how it works in action. So here we go. I've grabbed a photo. This one happens to be shot at 5600 ISO. Now that's getting up there. It's not as high as a lot of cameras can do today, but it's a pretty common setting. Any of that 4000 to 8000 range is very common for wildlife. And if you don't have a very fast lens, it might even go higher than that. And I'm just going to zoom in a little bit here. Let's jump over to edit first. I want to zoom in and show you what this guy looks like. Let's zoom up to 100. And for the Screencast, I'm gonna go even higher. Let's go to 200 so you can really kind of take a look at the noise that's in this photo. It's a There's very noisy photo, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like golf ball sized grain in there. Totally. Especially in some of these smoother areas like the little peacock feathers. Which should feathers. be detailed, a little more detail. Yeah, those sure. should be nice and smooth, clean. So to access no noise, you're gonna be inside of the develop tab of edit. You're gonna scroll down to the noise and sharpening pane. And then we're gonna switch from the classic noise reduction. Now, a lot of you might be asking, why are there two? Why is there a classic noise reduction and no noise AI? Well, it kind of depends on which one you need to use. If you're working on a normal low ISO photo, then using classic is gonna be great. But if you're using a higher ISO or on a particularly noisy camera, basically if classic doesn't do a good enough job, then you're gonna switch over to no noise. This is a great case for that. So I'm just gonna switch from classic to no noise. You notice how it zoomed back to 100%. It's going to apply no noise. We're gonna see that on the right and on the left-hand side, we're gonna kind of see the before image, the one we were just looking at. So I'm gonna zoom back to 200 so we can take a closer look at this. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's a pretty big difference. I'm gonna grab a little slider here in the middle. I'll wiggle it back and forth so you can kind of see before and after. So there's before no noise and there's after. It's pretty crazy what I can do. I'm just gonna turn that splitter off here. I'm just gonna bring the peacock's head oh, over wow. here so yeah. you can kind of see. That's a big difference. That looks way better than it was before. It does. It's pretty fast. It's very powerful in what it can do. Let me kind of give you a quick tour of how you actually adjust all the little sliders in there to get the best results. Now, because it's AI based, you don't have to wiggle a whole bunch. That's the cool thing about it. It's going to start off in auto mode. Auto is going to analyze the photo. It's going to pick the right amount of luminance noise reduction for that photo. And that's really keyed off of your preferences as well. In the preferences, you can decide how much noise reduction you like. If you're an old school film guy, you might like a smaller amount of noise reduction and see a little bit more of that film grain in there. Or more like me, you kind of like most of that noise to go away. So you control that right here on the luminance slider. I'm just going to turn these other sliders off so we can look at these one at a time here. So if I bring all these down to nothing, that's with no noise reduction at all. That looks just like the original. Now watch as I bring that luminance noise reduction slider up. That's the one that's going to kill all of that noise. And it's at auto about 97. You know, I'm going to kind of agree with it. I like it something in that 90 totally. to that 100 looks, range. That looks right about there. Yeah. yeah. And then the one, the third one, we're going to skip the uh, enhanced detail for a second. We're going to go to color. Color is for reducing color noise. Now, depending on the camera and depending on the photo, it might be hard to see. You'll see it a lot more in night photos, but you'll see a little bit of color noise here in these smooth areas of this feather where you kind of get like this magenta green stippling going okay, on. I see that. Yeah. Yeah. So watch when I pull that color slider up, that's oh, just yeah. going to go away completely. Now, I've never found a photo where I don't want that at 100. I pretty much leave it at 100 all the time. The AI does such an amazing job, there's no reason not to have it at 100. Other tools will spudge color on edges if you turn it up really high. You don't have to worry about that with no noise AI. So that's the noise reduction. That's kind of what the photo would look like with just the noise reduced. Now let's see what we can do to enhance the detail. It goes beyond just noise reduction to also bringing out the detail in the photo. And a lot of that's powered by that deep, raw data that we have. So watch, I'm gonna grab the Enhanced Detail slider. This is a lot more than a sharpening algorithm. It actually is going back to the bare level oh, of wow. the raw photo and can bring up the detail without causing any of the edge artifacts you'd see with a traditional sharpening algorithm. So there we go. That looks great, yeah. Yeah, and then I like just to 
little bit of a regular sharpening too. Something just for that like punch, that. Just for that little yeah, punch. Yeah, kind of gets the, the little smallest stuff. So let me yeah. turn this on and off so you can kind of see the difference here. So there's before okay. with no noise reduction. And after, let me go back to a fit view. Actually, let's go to a normal 100% view. So it's a little easier to see here. And let me turn that on and off again. So there's before and there's after. Oh yeah, it's even really noticeable at 100%. Yeah, and like I said, this is all built in to Photo Raw 2022 now. And the cool thing is it works just like any other non-destructive setting, just like your exposure, your color, or your effects, it works the same way. I can save it into a preset, I can copy and paste it from photo to photo. I don't have to generate a new child file to work on it. It's just another setting, it's very cool. That's awesome, and you can use it directly with your favorite creative workflows now, because it's directly right inside of Photo yeah. Raw. It's right there, right where you wanna work. You don't have to go out to another plugin, another application to do this. You can do it right here where you work all the time. It's awesome. All right, now let's take a look at the next big new feature in Photo Raw 2022, and that's SkySwap AI. Dylan, why don't you show us how it works? All righty, so in SkySwap AI, it's an amazing new feature that allows you to quickly replace and swap out boring skies for the skies that you envisioned when you were taking the image. So let's jump in here real quick into SkySwap AI. So real quick, before I jump into SkySwap, I just wanna set the foundational look for this image. So I'm just gonna use this handy AI auto feature. I'll select that just to bring in a bit of contrast to the scene. Now we can head into this new tab, the newest um, tab inside of Photo Raw 2022, the Sky tab. And this is an awesome, awesome feature for when you're looking to take these you know, bland, boring, cloudless skies and turning, turn them into something magnificent. You got a little dust there too, buddy. Well, the great thing about this is it's going to find this sky and it won't even really matter. No, it's just gonna wipe the dust it's off. It's just gonna take, it's just gonna replace that sky anyway. So, and one thing that's uh, awesome about this new feature is it creates a mask for you. So you can see it's already created the mask, it's seen the sky, it's done all the work for me. So now all I have to do is go down here into these skies and I can use any of these creative skies to instantly make wow. my photo look way better. That's really cool. You look how it even changed the foreground so it looks more like a sunset. It picked exactly. up the color from the sky and added it to the foreground. Exactly. That's pretty cool. So if you go into the foreground area, you can actually modify the lighting for your foreground. So if you are using different skies, for example, maybe a cloudier sky or a brighter sky, you can modify the lighting in here and switch the mode to screen. Obviously it doesn't look very good with this guy, but we're using the multiply to darken that up. And you can also choose the specific color that it, it tints the foreground with. So I'm going, I'm going to just leave it as is here, but you can choose a specific color here, and you can also use this color dropper to pick a specific color in your photograph. Little pro tip, what it does is it actually looks at the new sky that you've picked and it picks the average color out of it so that it knows the right color to tint the foreground with it. But like Dylan said, you can always override it with a dropper or that little color well too. To customize it, yeah. Now I've got a question coming in from the uh, YouTube audience. They wanna know if they can use their own skies with this. And yes, you can. Skies are just another class of extras, just like backgrounds and borders and textures and LUTs and brushes and all the other cool stuff that you can add in to Photo Raw. You'll notice there's a little import button at the top. You press that import button and you can import all your own skies. Plus there are tons of other skies that we will provide that you can purchase from our website in the future. Yeah, let me just show you real quick, navigating to a few of these skies. So we have these autumn skies here. I can just select these skies. I'll choose open. I've actually imported these, so I don't need to import them. And then it'll just show up right there. And we have all of our own custom skies that you know, we've created or found, and we can import those directly into Photo Raw. And watch now, I can go into these skies, my autumn skies. Oh yeah, see at the bottom it says my skies, and those are the ones that yeah. you've imported. If I open up bottom. that category here, I can go down here, and there's a bunch of different categories that I can choose from. And then I have my own custom category here with my skies. So I can roll open this sky menu here and I can just, you know, play with a few of these, see which works, which doesn't. That actually works pretty good on this photograph, but I really like this first one. Hey, while we're here, let's take a look at the mask. Can you hit the O key? Yeah. And we'll actually see what that mask looks like. So you can see how it's kind of automatically found the sky, but it's also kind of feathered it in a little bit. Try wiggling the fade edge and shift edge slider, and you can kind of see some of the manual control that you have over that mask where you can control how it fades into the new sky and how it can shift that edge back and forth. Now, Dylan's doing that in the mask view so you can kind of see how that works. And if you're a real masky kind of guy, you understand what that does, but let's turn the mask view off 
and wiggle those sliders. You can kind of see how it lets you control we'll how it blends. Zoom in here real quick. So if I modify this fade edge slider, you can see that I can fade the edge to you know whatever sky I'm you know trying to replace it with, and it can cater that sky to my scene for me. And I can also alleviate a bit of the harshness of the edge with this shift edge slider. And another great thing I can do is I can modify, let me just set these back to normal. I can actually modify the scale of these skies to make them larger and fit the scene even better. Yeah, yeah that's really handy. And it's something like this where it's got kind of that, that very pink highlight at the bottom of it, that might not fit my foreground very well, but you can use that shift horizon slider and you can move it up or down within your scene as well. So you can kind of make it blend in and look a little bit more realistic as well. You have all sorts of control and with the opacity slider, you can also just blend it in with the existing sky. So if you don't want to replace the sky, you just want to blend them together. You can do that by adjusting the opacity slider too. Oops. Now, if you're a crazy mask guy like me, you can also copy and paste that mask and use it in other ways inside of Photo Raw. It's just like a normal mask. There's even a new command called mask sky that allows you to generate a mask of the sky when you're in layers or when you're in effects. Very handy way to localize an adjustment to just the area that you're interested in. All right, now that's a pretty uh, uh, realistic, a typical, a conservative approach to sky replacement. Yes, exactly. I want to show you how to take it to 11. So let's switch over to me. How let's do jump I do into that? Dan's. Let me show uh, you how to do this one here. There we go. All right, oh, that's you. There we go. There we go, that's me. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to take this photo, shot in the middle of the day, and we're going to do this. We're going to turn it into like Wizard of Oz, oh, wow. dark black and white Dan. storm. All right, so here's what we're going to do. Now I feel like I should have brought a better sky. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's take this guy. I'm going to jump over to edit. You know, the real cool thing about this, and the reason I wanted to show you this, is that the skies, they're just another non-destructive setting within your stack. So all the other stuff I can do, all the things I can do in develop, all the things I can do in effects, I can do sky at any time in that stack and change it. So I'm going to start off with this, and I'm going to go straight to effects, and let's make it a black and white photo. So I'll just grab the black and white filter, and I'm just going to open up my little filter presets here. I think that's an easy way to go shopping for one that I like. I want a pretty dark, dramatic one. Ooh, here we go. We'll that's the this. one I was thinking too, yeah. yeah. Looks good. So there we go. So that looks pretty good, but you know, it's great for the daytime, but I want it to look like it's a storm instead. So watch, I'll just click over to sky now. It's gonna automatically find the existing real sky, and then I'll just go find a stormy one instead. So I'll switch over to storm. Oh, nice. And then let's, Go down until we find one that had that crazy lightning in it. Ooh, there we go. Ooh, Look wow. at that. So there we go. So I've made it black and white, and I have replaced it with from a sunny sky to a dark sky. While I'm here, I'll just use the shift edge and fade edge slider a little bit to clean up that little bit of a halo right on the edge of the barn. See how I can adjust how it's going to blend in. So I want it to oh, be nice. a tight blend like that. There we go. That Pretty cool. Great. Yeah. So we went from sunny color happy day to dark, ominous thunder day, yeah, just like wow. that. So yeah, pretty That's cool. It's crazy what you can do with the sky replacement. And it could be anywhere from a very subtle addition of a little bit of puffy clouds that blends into your existing sky for someone who's being very conservative to a whole sky replacement like Dylan showed you to the core of a completely stylized composite like I created. Totally. So totally very flexible. Now I've got another question here that's coming from the audience and they want to know if their new Fuji X-E4 camera is supported inside of 2022. And yes, it happens to be. We've actually added eight new cameras in this. I'm not going to read them all off because I can't keep track of all of them. But if you go to the website on our Knowledge Base article, there's a list of all the cameras that are supported, including the new ones that we've added. Plus, we've added a bunch of new lens profiles and done a lot of work to make lens profiles work even better. So, all right, let's talk a little bit about what is actually my favorite feature. And I think it's a sleeper, but very important feature in Photo Raw 2022. And that's the new powerful export dialog. Oh, yes, a very powerful yeah. feature inside yeah. of Photo So Raw if you're an existing user and you're used to using export, this is going to be like export on steroids. We literally went to the raw project. If you guys are familiar with that, it's a section of our website where our users go and they make suggestions about what they want things to do. I combed through that and I came up with over a hundred suggestions oh, wow. from users like you guys to kind of craft what I'm hoping you guys think is the ultimate export dialogue you're ever going to see. It really is, you guys. All right, so let me show you how it works. Let's switch over here. All right, so I'm in edit. You can do this in edit or in browse. You can do it with a single photo, multiple photos, a whole folder of photos folders of folders of photos, you name it, anything you want. I'm just going to come down here and click on the export button. Export dialog is going to pop up in the middle. I'm going to make it just a little bit bigger so I don't have to scroll so much. It'll remember its size and position, which is handy. 
On the left-hand side, you're going to see presets. Presets are really important to the new export dialog. It comes with some great ones to get you started. You can create your own, of course. The cool thing about those presets is you can use more than one at a time. So you could actually batch process two different outputs, three different outputs at the same as time. As many as you want. Yeah. So let's say, photo's great. I want to make a JPEG with a watermark for my blog, but I also want to make a full-size TIFF that's rendered that goes to my backup drive. I could do two different presets that does that for me all in one step. Super handy. The other great thing about those presets is you can access them inside of uh, Browse from the file menu. You can actually apply a preset on the fly to a single photo or a group of photos. Very handy way to work. All right, so let me show you how we're actually gonna get to work here. I'm gonna walk you through all of the individual panes because there's so much new stuff in here. I kinda wanna show you everything that it can do. And we literally put everything on 11 for this. So let's start off over here in the naming pane, which is rolled, uh, rolled up here. Let me turn it on. So naming has changed quite a bit. It used to be you had the options of a custom text or the original file name or a number or a date, I think. Now you can have anything you want and you can mix and match freeform text with any metadata piece of information that you have. It's a little different to use, so let me show you how it works. In this field right here, you can type in whatever you want or you can use tokens or you can mix them. So let's say I wanna do one where it uses my original file name plus some freeform text that matters to me and then I could add something like the date to it. That's a common thing to do, all right? Yeah. So I'm gonna click on add token. I'll go to file name and I'll just pick file name. But you notice I can also use the folder name, which a lot of us use as a job name, mm -hmm. or we could also do just the number in the file name. A lot of times, you know, the number might be like IMG underscore, and then the number that's actually important to us and no one cares about the IMG part. Well, I could just skip the IMG part just by picking the file name number suffix instead. All right, so I'm gonna pick file name, and then I'm gonna put in a little edit for me. So I'm just gonna say this is uh, sky swap, because that's what I did. Yeah. And then I want to add in the date that the photo was taken. So I click on add token again. I'll go to date and time and I can put in the date and I can put in any date I want in any format I want, any bits and pieces of it that I want. I just want to put in the year, year, month, month, day, day. That's the format that I like. So there we go. And you notice right here at the top, it gives me an example of what it's going to look like. It shows me there's the current file name. There's the sky swap part that I put in and there's the date. You notice I kind of run it all together. I want to put a space in here. So I'm just going to put a little space in here and a little space right here just to spread those out. There we go. That looks a little bit better. Yeah. And I can control the extension as to whether it's capitalized or lowercase. And you can also modify the tokens inside of the text box as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like if I decided, you yeah, know, that wasn't the date format I wanted, I can just click in here and I can pick a different date format or change it to anything yeah. you want. The tokens are crazy, which you can pick from. So I showed you the file name and the date, but you can also do sequence numbers in different formats. Metadata, and you can use metadata, metadata from just about anything. Any of your camera information, your ratings and labels, any IPTC metadata that you've anything. added. You can do all sorts of crazy stuff. And you can save that as a preset. We include some really common ones for you right in here of different naming presets but you can save your own so that you can always access the way yeah. you like to name your files and not have to do it every time. And I'll tell you, this same renaming that you see here is also in the batch renaming dialog and it's also in the import dialog and it shares those presets. So the same thing you can do here, you can also do at the import time, which is when most of us want to do that file renaming. All right, let me jump back and we'll talk about the next pane here in export. I'm going to roll up naming. Let's roll up some of these other guys so we can just kind of focus on the one we're interested in. Let's look at destination. So this is where the file or files are going to go. I can send it to its current location. I could pick any other folder I want to. I can automatically send it to my desktop. We know about the desktop. Or I can use the ask when exporting option, which is perfect if I'm making presets. Each time I use that preset, it's going to ask me where I want to save it to. So it's really handy to do it on the fly. So in this case, let's just say I want to put it in the same folder as the original, but I could also generate a new subfolder to put it in and just give it a name. So I could call it oh, export maybe if I wanted to. Oops, helps if I spell it right. You notice it tells me how much space is going to be needed. It counts up all the photos and all the photo sizes and tells me how much it's going to need. And depending on the, the volume that I'm going to, how much room I have available for it. Now, if this put in subfolder is not powerful enough for you, if you want even more control over the subfolders that it generates, we can go down here and we can turn on generate subfolders. Generate subfolders works just like those tokenized names, but I can actually divide up the work based on any metadata I want to. 
So let's say I want to take all the photos I export and I want to have them put them into year, month, day folders. I can do that. So I can come down here and I'll just say, let's add the uh, year first. Let's do a four digit year. And then I want to also do one for the month. I'll do month and then I'll do day with a number. So you can see it's now going to take all the photos in my selection. It's going to do all the work. It's going to export them and it's going to divide them up into folders based on year and then subfolders for the month and then subfolders for the day. Nice. You can do it by camera. You can do it by lens. You can do it by whatever you want to organize your output into. It's crazy powerful what you can do with it. All right. Then when it's actually done exporting, I have some options of what it's going to do. I can have it show in the Finder or show in the Explorer. That means it's going to pop up your normal operating system window so you can see where it lives. A lot of us do that. But you can also turn on as many of these little options as you want to. I could also have it take all of the results and make a zip file for it. Just really handy if I need to share it or upload it. I can take all of them and zip them. Or I could have it open up into another application. It'll find the most common applications for you, but you can also pick any other application. Once you've picked it, it will remember it. That could be an FTP application, for example, or the Smugbug desktop app if you want to upload to Smugbug, you name it. And for really advanced users, there's even an option to run a script. So you could actually oh, wow. put in, using scripting script language, a script in there that could do whatever you want. That could upload to an FTP for server, for example, whatever you want it to do. So crazy powerful what you can do with the results when it exports. All right. Whew, I feel like I need a break, and yeah, we're only through two of the pain yeah, so far here. All right, let's keep going. The next one is file type. File type, you control what file type the photo is going to do. Pretty obvious, right? So you can pick from these range of file types. The cool thing is there's a couple new file types. We now can export to a DNG file. Okay. So you can export to now to a DNG raw file. You can even export the original file while you're in browse. So you can make just copies of the original. Very easy way. And then on all of these formats, you have tons more control over what the file type looks like. So not only can you pick the uh, color profile and the bit depth, but you can also control things like quality and compression and if it's going to flatten it or preserve transparency for TIFF and PSD files. Every option you need based on the format you choose. Then below that is the ability to resize. And we took every single way you could ever conceive of resize. You can control the size, width, and height. You could do dimensions. You could do the long size, short side, width, height, megapixels, <laughs> percentage. I'm running anything, out of fingers. It kind of all want. the different ways that you could resize these guys. So you notice these all up here, here in the resize option. So you can really pick exactly what you want. So let's say I need to fit all of these photos into 1920 by 1080 but I don't want it to crop, and I don't care if they're horizontal or if they're vertical or not. So I'm going to pick dimensions. I'm going to pick 1920 by 1080. Let's say I'm making a slideshow. There we go. Oops, that's not the dimension, that's the resolution. We'll use 96 because I'm doing it for screen. There we go. Oh, you're locked. Oops, well, good call. It also picks up the dimensions of the file that I'm working on it and it, it knows what it is. So it locks the dimensions together so I don't accidentally crop the photo unless, in this case, I intend to <laughs> be able to do that. So here we go. Let's do 1920 there by 1080. Go. I'm going to turn off the rotate option. It'll automatically rotate the photo. Or it doesn't rotate the photo, I should say. It rotates the dimensions width and height based on the photo, whether they're horizontal or vertical. In this case, I don't want that. So I'll turn that off. And I have the option of how it's going to fill that box. So I'm making a 1920 by 1080 box, right? I can either have it fit the photo within the box, mm -hmm. or I could have it blow the photo up so that it fills, it the, fills box, the box, which is going to crop stuff off, right? Yeah. So I control what I want. So I want it to fit in the dimensions, not fill the dimensions. This is just one example. There's a gazillion different ways that you could potentially resize your photos. And it's very powerful in the options that it gives you. All right. Next up, sharpening. So most photos, when you export them out, you're going to shoot them down in size. You want to sharpen them for whatever output you're going to do. We have built-in presets for the most common options, whether you're printing or saving for a screen. But if you need more control than that, you can roll down the manual option, and you have full control over the amount and radius and threshold. And a lot of that's going to be based on your knowledge of sharpening and what kind of settings you need for your output media and size. All right, let's keep going. Uh, two, two more to go. Two more. Two more to go, and they're big ones, though. All right, next up is metadata. So in the past, we always exported all the metadata on every photo. Now you have control over what actually gets written into it. Now the default is it's still just going to write everything that was in the original photo. But if you don't want someone to know your address, you don't want them to see your GPS metadata, things like that, you can turn that off. Or if you want to hide your camera information, you can turn that off. 
So now it'll show all the different areas that you can turn on and turn off. So if I don't want it to have the location, I can just uncheck the GPS option, for example, and that'll go away. I can also assign metadata presets on the fly, which is really handy too. So if I have a set of metadata that I use for exporting only that has additional contact or copyright information, from the presets, I just pick that preset that I've created and it assigns metadata on the fly. All right, how are we doing, Dylan? Great. Great, all right. You're still blowing my mind. Whew, one more to go, and that is watermark. This is a biggie. So with watermarks, there's actually two different kinds of watermarks. You can either do a text-based watermark with a text, that's live text, or you can do an image-based watermark. But what if I want both? I can hear Dylan, <laughs> I want both. Well, yes, you can have both. You can have as many watermarks on your photo as you want using any mix of text and photo that you want to do. So in this case, I'm going to put the on one logo in the bottom corner. And I'm going to put camera information in the other corner. So watch. I'll hit the add watermark button. Let's start with the logo, the t image one. That's the easy one. I'm going to grab a logo. I'm going to switch over and I'm going to use the made with on one logo. You see it puts it over here. That's its default spot is in the bottom left, but I could pick wherever I want it to go in my photo. You see the little preview up there to tell me where it's at. I'm going to put it in the bottom corner. It's very professional. It's very professional. It's very professional though. And of course, you notice there's an import button. You can import your own images. So if you've got your little signature that you like to put at the bottom of your pictures or your company logo, you can import them and add them into the watermark dialog. I'm going to stick it over here. I'm going to make it a little smaller. I'm going to reduce the opacity so it's not quite so obvious. There we go. Now, on the right-hand side, I want to put in information about the camera that I used. So, watch what we'll do. I'll just come over here and click on the Add Watermark button again. This is going to add another one. I'm going to add a text-based watermark now. There we go. Now, that text-based watermark is right down here. And I can use all of those same tokens that I used when I was doing things like generating folders oh, or renaming. Nice. I could pick those here, too. Of course, I could just type in whatever I wanted too. So yeah. right now it's just says your text because that's the default. But Is that what let's you want? change that. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> so awesome. let's go to metadata, camera, camera model. Ba -do -ba -do. I need my reading glasses, Dylan. So here we go, camera model. Go. And then I'm going to hit, re oops, oh, I got rid of it. Let's try that again. One too many backspaces. Model. Um. And then I'll hit return. So this goes to another line. Let's put in the uh, lens. Uh, camera, lens, there we go. And let's put in the basic exposure information as well. So we'll go down to metadata, camera, and we'll just grab the exposure. And that'll put in like the shutter speed and aperture. Perfect. There we go. Cool. Now that's obviously way too big and obnoxious. So I want to put it on the bottom right-hand side. Oops, helps to be on the right one here. This one, bottom right-hand side. Let me roll up the logo so we can see both of these guys at the same time. Oh, there we go. So there's our text. Way too big. I put it where I want it. I want it to be aligned right rather than left. And I want the size to be way there smaller. We there we go. Doesn't need to be inset quite so much. And we'll do the opacity down about where we had it. Nice. So there we go. It's going to put the little on one logo over here. It's going to put whatever text watermark I want based on metadata over here. And of course, I don't have to just do this every time. If that's what I like, I can just go in and make a preset of it. And yeah. it will save that. I can use it over and over again. All right, so there you go. That is all the crazy cool things you can do in the new export dialog. Again, everything you could ever want in an export. You can save it as a preset, use multiple presets, and apply presets on the fly from browse. It's the most powerful way to get your hard work that you've done in Photo Raw out so other people can see it. Right. Very, very powerful, then. Very powerful. It's powerful Ooh. image converter as well. It awesome. is. I feel awesome. like I need a, need a break now. <laughs> yeah. All right. Points features in one thing. So that's a big one. Now let's talk about our next one, and that is time lapse creation. Time lapse creation, another amazing feature inside of the latest version of Photo Raw, especially for those photographers out there looking to create some time lapse video with their still sequences. So let's jump into a time lapse sequence that I photographed. So inside of Photo Raw 2022 here, I have about 250 photos from a time lapse sequence that I shot. And these images were actually originally photographed in color. So let's just reset one. <laughs> I was going to say, you shot them on black and white? Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, there we go. So they're all shot in color. Um, let me just up the thumbnail size here. And what I did is I went in here and I applied this black and white modern preset to all of these images. Just, just like just that. just applied it to one yep. and then just synced to all of them, right? Yeah. Well, okay. I, basically what I did is I just, I just selected them all and then I selected this preset okay. and applied it to them all. But, cool. um, so now that I've converted all of these, um, what I can do is just head over here to this all new time lapse feature. I'll select that. 
and it immediately pulls up this time lapse dialog, and I can instantly see a preview of that time lapse in action. Ooh, that's pretty cool. Right? It's kind of cool you can see it right away. Because exactly. I've, I've used a lot of other time lapse apps, and you just got to wait forever to export all the photos out and just before hope you can it ever works. see a preview. Exactly. Here you can see what's going to happen. Exactly. And then, uh, besides the preview, we have a few different options we can use to modify how that time lapse is rendered and um, output it. So, the first modifier is our raw input, which allows us to modify the file type that we actually put into the time lapse. If you're looking to just create a fast time lapse, maybe you're just looking to create a proof or something like that, you could just use this embedded JPEG that will take the embedded JPEG from your RAWs and it will uh, use those for the time lapse video if you're using a raw image. Um, another thing you can modify is the size. So if you're looking to create a smaller file, again, for maybe just a proof or a draft, you can modify the size in here. And also what it does is it automatically crops the image or the time lapse video for you. But if you want to maintain your original ratio or the letterbox uh, view, you can select that here to get the rest of the, the image in the scene. I'm going to deselect that and disable that because I do like the, the 16 by 9 crop there. We can also modify our codec, our quality, and our frame rate. So if you do want to modify any of these settings, if you're comfortable modifying different video settings, you can modify those in here, and it's really simple to do. Uh, I'm just going to leave them how they are. I, and like like Bill said, if you're comfortable with it, these are like the settings that like everybody uses. Yeah, the, the defaults are awesome. They're exactly. Very rare. Works, you never need to change works, those. Yeah, yeah, works great just how it is. Honestly, the only thing I would modify is the size. I, you know, just pick which size you're going to use, and then you're good to go. Uh, well, another thing you can modify too is the speed. So if you do have, uh, let's say you've only shot a time lapse with you know, 50 frames or so rather than 250 frames. If you want to make that time lapse a little bit longer, you can grab this speed handle here and you can either speed up that time lapse or you can make it longer in duration and it will still have that same beautiful smooth effect between those, those frames. And if you look up at the title bar, so if you set it at 1x, it'll tell you how long it's going to be. So that one's going to be like 8 seconds. 8 seconds. If I move this up, if I slow this down, now it's going to be a minute and 33 seconds. So we've really taken that eight second time lapse and expanded it, but it's still gonna get that amazing, you know, smooth time lapse transition look. Yeah. You're probably asking, how do you do that? How do you do that? How do you add those other frames? Well, what we basically do is we take the two frames that are next to each other, and then we actually interpolate. We generate another photo on the fly that's kind of half of each of them, if you will. It's called a linear interpolation. So that when you actually play the video back, it looks much slower but you don't get like these funny blurry effects like you would if you're just like mm -hmm. take the opacity totally. for example so it looks pretty good we like yeah. it looks great and then another thing that is awesome is it you can detect camera movement inside of your time lapse videos as well so if you are shooting you know without a sturdy tripod or something like that it's windy it can detect those movements and it will align those frames for you yeah or if you kick your tripod yeah like exactly exactly so. you know you're sitting there for a few hours you might yeah. kick your tripod yeah. uh Another thing it will fix is exposure changes. You know, if we're shooting time lapses from uh, different times of day, maybe from morning to night or something like that, it's going to have a lot of exposure change in the scene. What we can do is reduce flicker in those moments with this reduce flicker option and we'll blend those flames together uh, much better. Yeah, and that, a lot of that kind of depends on your camera. If you're shooting time lapse in a time lapse mode on a modern camera, they actually do a pretty good job of kind of automatically reducing that flicker. They can vary the ISO kind of infinitely mm -hmm. so that as the, as the overall exposure changes throughout the scene, going from day into night, for example, you don't really see it. It's a very smooth thing. But if you're using an older camera with a manual intervalometer, a third of a stop or half a stop is kind of the, yeah, the smallest yeah. change it can make, which is pretty big if you're watching a video. That's where that reduced flicker can come in really handy Very to help handy. smooth that out. Mm -hmm. Now, there's also some tips when shooting uh, uh, time lapse. That's make sure you don't use everything in auto. You don't want your exposure mm -hmm. fluctuating a bunch all the time on you. You kind of want the camera to do that based on that that mode. It makes it look a lot better totally. to do that. So. Time lapse is one of those kind of pre. It can't be fixed in post. Really. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you got to capture that one. Yeah, right. it's totally. Not, it's not going to work. Totally. So, yeah. Alrighty, so um, I've processed that uh, time lapse video. Let's just take a look. I'm going to open that up here. And here we go. This is from that sequence of images that we were just Ooh, look at looking that. at. And there we go. You know, awesome. I feel like you need like some angels singing or something. Yeah, like right? How fun is that? And just, just from by. a bunch of still photos. Nice. So. That's pretty cool. You know, I love that you can actually add the effect to it. 
you know, yeah, you, you can look at other things, things yeah. other other video apps. You're kind of stuck with either you shot in the camera, or if you have to go and apply to all the photos and then export out new photos to do that. That takes exactly. forever to exactly. do that. Here, everything's not destructive. It can render it all on the fly. It's very fast to make those changes, and you can preview them right there in the dialog. You know, if it's what you like, so it's very handy. And you can do all sorts of things. You can crop in there. You can do dust removal. That's actually yeah. my favorite. So thing. if you go Just in go here, and remove dust. if you see, yeah, obviously I could have gone in there, but what you can do is you can actually go in there and you can remove all of the dust spots, do all of the retouching you need to those images before you send it to time lapse. It'll take that information and it'll put it into a video. It's, yeah. an, it's incredible. So another awesome feature inside of Photo Raw 2022 is the all new, not all new, we're bringing it back. We're bringing line, it back, baby. The line mask the tool. The line mask tool. We're bringing the line mask tool back, and it's more powerful than ever. So it is crazy powerful. So the big difference is the line mask in the past, if you weren't familiar with the line mask, it's like a pen tool or the polygonal lasso tool. Say that ten times fast. <laughs> polygonal lasso or polygonal. <laughs> I don't know which way it is. Nuclear, nuclear, I don't know how you say it. But anyway, it lets you create a mask based on a shape. You just draw line segments. So if you had like a window, it was really handy for drawing a mask around a window. But the new one is so much more powerful. You can now curve lines, you can add line or add dots, points, yep, add points. points. That's what we call add them. Add and remove points to a to a line, delete a point. You can change the feather, change the opacity. It's all non-destructive, much, much more powerful than the old yeah. one. So check yeah. this out. Check Watch still out. in action. All right, so what we want to do here is just selectively modify the area outside of the car, right? To do that, we need a tool that can, that can curve. If we were to just use a, you know, a poly poly polygonal, polygonal lasso, lasso tool yeah. um, that didn't curve, we, could, we couldn't get these windows right. Yeah. But now or we'd have to do like a bazillion little points yeah. all the way around the square. It's just kind of the way I use the pen tool in Photoshop because I can't figure out how to use exactly. it. Exactly, yeah. Because it's just too hard. Now with this super intuitive, very simple tool, all I have to do, I'll just drop a point. Actually, let me just zoom in a little bit more here. Dan's got the... Why don't you uh, put a blur on it first so we kind of have an idea of what we're going to do with oh, it. Oh, yeah. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to add a blur onto this image just to show you guys what I'm going to do later on. I'm just going to add a blur with a little bit of motion in here into this window. Obviously, it won't be on our, uh, our bride there, but we are going to have a little bit of blur in the windows. And to do that, we're going to use this line mask tool. I'm just so zooming in here to the window. And really cool feature that we're going to talk about later on is the gestures, which allows me to zoom in on the trackpad. Look at that. He's I doing know. it with his fingers. Yeah. Um, and uh, what I'm going to do is just grab that line mask tool. I can drop this down. And if I need to curve a line, so obviously that's not curved there, I can just grab this point And look at that. Look at that. Ooh, I've curved it right handy. directly on to like the it. window. It doesn't have those little confusing handles that pop out. The Bezier handle? Yeah. yeah. Ooh, very even, confusing. I'm not French. I can't pronounce it. But <laughs> I have just never in like 20 years figured out how to make those little things they do what I want. They are confusing. So, yeah. And this, look how easy this That's is. a lot easier. Look how easy that is. Yeah. I mean, you drop a point, you want to curve it, you head back to the middle of the line. Just like that. You're very precise. Perfect. You, and look at that. In no time at all. I mean, if you didn't want to be as precise as I was, mm -hmm. you could easily get it a little quicker. Um, but so now let's just add in that blur to that. So I'm going to go to paint in. Mm -hmm. So I can paint in that blur. Let's just click. And we're, we're painting in because we inverted the mask. Yes, right? we inverted yeah. the mask earlier. Yeah. So we're painting this in right now. Uh, but now if I zoom out, Already, it's looking a little bit more interesting back there. It's not so stale. And we can continue to do that to all of these, these windows here really quickly with that line mask tool. And I won't be as precise here, Dan. I'll be a little bit more just quick for the, the premiere. Yeah. Well, the cool thing is these are all, these are all non-destructive. They're all re-editable. So once Dylan has created that shape and he turns on the filter so you can see how it's applied, you can always go back and change it. You can change the opacity of it. You can change the feather, basically how soft the edge is after the fact. You could recurve the line. You could add points, remove points. It's all stored just like any other brush stroke or the masking bug or any of those masking options. And they work hand in hand with all the other masking tools. So you could use, for example, I could use AI Quick Mask to start. Then I could use the line mask tool to refine it and finish it up with a regular masking brush if I wanted to. And they all work hand in hand, super handy. All right, let's take a look here. We've done another window. I'm just going to add that on Knock there, it out. just I like, like it. that. Yeah. There we go. And I'll just do this one real quick here. It won't take too long. Bada bing. This one's a little bit easier than the rest. Oops. There we go. 
And you can see how you can go off the canvas if you need to go all the way around an edge. Look at that. Go. You know what I would do? Looking at that, the edge is a little too soft. I'd almost make it harder. So the cool thing is you can go back to that one that's selected and you can actually change the feather of it after the fact. There we go. So Look you at can that. make it harder or softer. And if you actually hit the O key, you can actually see what that mask looks like. Ooh, see, that's a really, really soft feather. mask. So we'll just turn that down to where we want. And, and we, we can, can also go, from, go back yeah. to this one if we exactly. need to. Pick so. it, turn the feather down. A little so, fat. Yeah, a little, a little bit, like a five or yeah. something right there. Yeah. yeah there so. we go. There you go. Let's go back to this one real quick. Cool. I yeah. think the back one looks okay. I don't know. Maybe we can let's go yeah. back to the. We can take a look. That's the cool thing about it. There we go. I think it yeah. looks pretty good. Yeah, I think it looks pretty I good. Might a little more feathered back there. So yeah. let me just finish this top real quick. We can't leave the job unfinished. Bada bing. Really easy to do. I love the curving of it. It's just so intuitive. Doop. I like it. You're such a hard worker. I would have just cropped it off. <laughs> no, there I'm we just go. <laughs> I would have finished it. I finished it. Zoop. There like we go. That. And then let's just view the mask. Yeah. I think it looks good. Looks good. There we go. Let's right. just click done. And look at that. There we go. Let's do the before and after. Before. After, look there. at that. That's a little so bit of spice in that background. So it looked like she was just sitting in the limo in a parking lot. Now she's zooming, she's zooming down the road through. towards her marital future. Exactly. So, exactly. Pretty handy. And of course, it's just like an MS. Copy, paste, go yeah. from layer to layer, invert them, re-edit them, all the same stuff that you could do in a mask. So if I wanted to copy this mask we just created, I'll add another filter. Obviously, dynamic contrast. Let's surreal it. Let's apply it everywhere else. So let's just paste that invert it, and now it's only applied around those windows. Perfect, perfect. I like it. Really easy way, really easy way to selectively apply anything or selectively mask yeah. around layers. Yeah. Really great way. To the do other it. place where I've used this is on uh, black and white photos. Like if you shot black and white film back in the day, most of modern masking tools are all based on color. So if it's a black and white grainy photo, oh, any of the yeah. automated tools, they're not going to work very well. Yeah. You can use this on black and white until the cows come home. It works great for That's that awesome. too. Yeah, so. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. Alrighty, let's see. What else we got next? Uh, ba -dee -ba -doo. I had a question about what's the best way to buy Photo Rock 2022. Now, most of you guys who are watching today are probably existing owners. You can just purchase the upgrade. You can go to our website and purchase it, or I guarantee you've received an email from us giving you the option to purchase it as well. You can also purchase the subscription version. Now, I, I know some of you guys are freaking out saying subscription. Well, subscription is an option. Not everybody's afraid of subscriptions out there. When you purchase the subscription to Photo Raw, you're guaranteed to always have the latest version all, every year. You can control the frequency you pay it, whether you want to pay monthly or yearly. And you also get the Cloud Sync service built in as well, which synchronizes all of your settings, all of your albums, all of your extras across all of your computers, and then allows you on the mobile devices to be able to actually see and edit your photos on your mobile devices remotely from your computer. It's super handy. So you can purchase it any way you want. You can purchase the perpetual license where you own that license forever, or you can buy the subscription. And as long as you continue to pay for it, you can continue to use it. We'll always offer perpetual options. So if you try the subscription, you decide, you know, I want to purchase it. You can always just switch plans as well. All right, let's see, what else we got? Photoshop plugins. So another awesome another feature. cool yes, thing. This, yeah. is, this is great. So if you guys think about Photo Raw or you think about on one, you think about, oh, Photoshop plugins. They work as Photoshop plugins, right? Well, we flipped it around. We now run Photoshop plugins inside of on one Photo Raw. I know it's a brain twister. You got to think it's kind of the <laughs> opposite of what you're used to doing. But a lot of our customers are kind of plugin collectors. They've collected tons of plugins over the totally. years. And that one plugin might do that one cool thing mm -hmm. that Photo Raw doesn't do. Or maybe it does something that they like better. So let me show you how you can access your Photoshop plugins inside of Photo Raw. The first thing you need to do is you need to tell Photo Raw where they live. And you can do that in the preferences. So if I go to my preferences and I go to the plugins tab, there's two places that you can access them. You can hit the default folder. So we kind of have our own plugins folder where you can put those guys in. Or if you have Photoshop installed, you can just turn on the secondary plugin folder option and choose your Photoshop plugin folder, which it will pick for you automatically if it has Photoshop installed. Once you've done that, it's gonna automatically pick up all of those Photoshop plugins. Now, when I say Photoshop plugins, I mean anything that you would see in the filter menu inside of Photoshop. 
I don't mean panels, I don't mean automation plugins, anything that you see in the filters menu, all right? And even at that, not every single one of them is going to work. There's a very long history of Photoshop plugins. They've been around forever. Not everybody does the best job of maintaining their plugins. So you might have one that's 10, 15 years old. Might not work because it's just too darn old. It doesn't support 16-bit or doesn't support modern APIs. On our webpage, there's actually a knowledge base article that shows all the ones that we tested and whether they worked or not. And pretty much anything that you can buy as a Photoshop plugin today will work. All right, so let me show you how to use it. So once your plugins are there, you just open a photo up into edit. And then we'll go up to the layer menu. And you see there's a new option here called filters. And it will show any plugins that you have installed. So I've installed some from Exposure and the Nick collection of plugins as well. So then I just pick one I want to use. Let's say I want to give this kind of an old school analog look. So I'm just going to use Analog Effects Pro. Nice, brings it right up. Just gotta wait for it to do it. Analog is kind of an older plugin, so it takes a little while. They got lots of cool presets in here though. So I'm just gonna go in here and pick one that I like. Let's go back. I want to grab the uh, double exposures. I think are pretty cool. Let's oh, go grab nice. one of these. Yeah. Oh, there that we go. That looks really yeah, cool. It's kind of cool. It's kind of got yeah. this cool double exposure look to it. I could adjust it if I wanted to, and I hit OK when I'm done. Now, what this is going to do is it's going to render those results to a new layer back inside of Photo Raw. The cool thing about that is your original photo with all of its non-destructive settings are still intact. We basically create a copy of that with all the settings applied and we apply whatever filter you ask on top of it. So here we are back inside of Photo Raw. You can see there's my original photo on the yeah. bottom. And if I'd done any settings to it, you'd still see those settings. And then there's the results on top. And of course, I can do any of the layered stuff that I'm used to doing. If I want to change my opacity to control how it blends in. Stylize that photo. Stylize it, mask it, blend whatever it, all the stuff you're used to doing you can do right inside of there. It's pretty darn cool. And we're really excited about it. I think you guys are gonna love being able to use your Photoshop plugins inside of Photo Raw 2022. Especially with, it's so easy. You just filter your plugins, right? Filter plugins, they're right there. Go. So yeah. All right, uh, I had another question from the audience here. They wanna know about Apple Silicon support. So if you guys aren't aware, Apple has kind of a whole brand new kind of processor that they're shipping their newest computers with. You'll see them as the M1 chip. It's a different processor architecture and requires the application to be updated. And yes, Photoraw 2022 does support the Apple uh, Silicon processors natively. So you're going to get the most performance, the most speed out of them as well. And you can still run them in on x86 processors and you can even run them what's called Rosetta, where you can emulate one on the other platform. So everything's there that you need to go. We're also going to update uh, Photoraw 2021 coming very soon, so people with the previous version will still be able to use it on M1 processors natively as well. Nice. All right, what do we got next? Oh, backing up and restoring. This is another big user requested feature over the years. Let me just cancel out of here. I'm gonna go back to browse. Now, when you commit to an application like Photo Raw, there's a lot of information that you end up creating for your photos. Things like all of those non-destructive settings on a photo by photo basis. Things like metadata and ratings and labels and all that sort of stuff mm -hmm. that you put in onto your photos. Now today, those are all stored in a local database on your computer, as well as in what's called a sidecar file. And that sidecar file stores all that stuff. So if your computer dies and you have to go to another computer, or if you move a photo from computer A to computer B, all of those edits, all of the metadata is all preserved in those sidecar files. So all of that just gets recreated automatically. And that's great on a photo by photo basis, but there's also certain things you do at the application level, which there's not an easy way to have moved from computer to computer in the past. Well, that's all changed now with the new backup and restore feature. It stores all of your albums, it stores all of your preferences, all of your presets, all of your styles, any of the extras that you've done, like backgrounds, borders, textures, LUTs, nice. brushes, skies. There's a couple I'm forgetting. There's a bazillion <laughs> of those things that it can do. It stores all of that into one backup that you can then move from computer to computer. It's really easy to do. So it's really easy to do. I'm just gonna go to the file menu and down to backup data. It's a very simple process. You just pick the location you want it to go. I'm just tapping to save mine. I like to put mine into my Dropbox folder. That way it's also backed up to the cloud as well. You always gotta have it backed up to the cloud, yeah. Yeah, I do. 
<laughs> I like it. Well, you know, this computer can die. Why exactly. save my backup on the computer that's going to die? Exactly. That's, that's the yeah. wrong place to store backup. So <laughs> at least put it on another drive if you're not going to put it in the cloud. Mm -hmm. And then it can also remind you from time to time to do it for you automatically. So you can, it can remind you once a week. So once a week when you quit, it's going to say, hey, do your backup, dude. Or you can turn it off or pick whatever frequency you want. Nice. You just hit the backup button, and now it's going to save all of that stuff. Like I mentioned, all your edits, all your metadata, all your albums, all your presets, all the extras, everything is going to get stored into that backup file. I'm going to hit the button here so I can go off and do that. Now, the one thing that this isn't going to back up is your photos themselves. The photo backup is still your responsibility. So wherever you organize them, whether it's in the cloud or on your local machine or on an external drive, that's still up to you to manage that backup. Now, let's say that I buy a new computer. I buy one of those fancy new Apple M1 Macs, right? And I want to be able to use it. Well, most people keep their photos on an external drive already. So I just take that external drive that was on my old Mac and I plug it into my new Mac. I install Photo Raw 2022 on it. And then I just go into the, let me show you here. Then I'll just go up to the file menu. I'll go down to restore data. This is right after I've signed into the app the first time on my new computer. I just go and I pick that backup file. So I'm going to take that backup file that's on my old computer. I'm going to move it to my new computer. You could just put it on the same drive where you kept your photos. That's a great way to move it. And then hit the restore button. Sweet. It's then going to go through and it's going to take all that stuff that it backed up, bring it to your new computer, and it's going to be just like you left that's off right where you nice. were. So perfect way to back up and restore your data, move from computer to computer, or recover from a horrible, horrible disaster that hopefully none of us ever have. But yes. you never know. It could happen. You never know. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah, backup and restore is an awesome new feature, and PhotoRaw is filled with a ton of new features. We could go on a really long time talking about these features. But another awesome new feature coming in uh, the new release of PhotoRaw 2022 is the modification of thumbnails. Now, you have a ton more control over how your thumbnails look, what's displayed on them, the size of them, tons of stuff. So let's jump in here. I'm just inside of Browse, and I have a few different photographs here of some birds. And all I have to do to modify these thumbnails is just right click and just choose thumbnail view options. Now I can modify tons of different things. I can modify the appearance, so the size, if I want them smaller, or if I want the appearance of the text to be a bit smaller, I can modify that here. I can also modify the fitting of that text, so if I want it to fill the area. So that's what we used to call the square thumbnails option. It's now put in here, so you just change the fitting, whether you want square or you want the regular thumbnails that show the whole photo. And that's just kind of a personal preference. I always yeah. like to show the whole photo myself because totally. I can't tell if it's horizontal or vertical if I don't do And that, now so. this looks to me, I'm just used to looking at it like a, a folder. Yeah. yeah, they look like folders yeah. now. Yeah. Folders, but you, you have control over, over where how they have the yeah, exactly. previews in here exactly. now too. Exactly. So. Another thing we can modify is the theme. This is an awesome uh, thing too if you want to modify it from light to dark. I know a lot of people are into modifying you know, the, the look of their UI. So this is a great way to kind of make these thumbnails fit your workflow. Yeah, change the fitting back to the regular one and let people see what it looks like. Oh, there we go. See, there, there we go. go. There see, we go. This is actually my new favorite view. I like that so lighter dark. background there's rather light. than the darker background. It really makes the, the photos pop. It really I like it. Pop. I yeah. like it, and especially if you're if you're kind of a someone who's used to the Lightroom world, you've used Lightroom for many years. This looks a little bit more Lightroom esque totally. too, because they have kind of that lighter background mm -hmm. color. It's just a matter of personal preference. The other thing I like about it is that you get a little bit more. Uh, how do I describe it? Each thumbnail has kind of its own house. Yes, <laughs> you know, the, totally. You can see the borders of the thumbnails. Yeah, where yeah. in the in the dark view, it's very modern, totally. so you don't really see when one thumbnail ends and the other one begins. This mm -hmm. one's a little more of a box. Totally. They have little frames form. around them. Yeah. yeah, little frames. There you go. Yeah. That's what I was trying to say. And we can modify the labels too. So you can see up here we have the left and it says ratings and label. And so if we look up here, we have our ratings and the label. But if we want that to be a different label, let's say we want it to be the file name. We can choose the file name to be up there rather than the ratings. And then we can choose the ratings and the labels to be on the bottom. Mm -hmm. you, know, and you, can, you can switch this around any different way to modify it how you, how you like it. And we can also modify that top right area as well. So right now it's the like option, but we can choose maybe folder to show that this is the folder that we're looking at yeah. here. Or you can put like the exposure info. A lot of people like to know what their exposure info was. A lot of times I'll do that there we so go. I can see my shutter speed and aperture yeah. that I used. Just like that. And there's a few different options that you can modify down in here. You, know, you can choose whether to show the information without hovering over it or show the information while you hover over it. It's just kind of all personal preference, but there's just so much more control over those 
those thumbnail view options nowadays. Yeah, I really like that. There's also some cool options in the bottom where you can control whether you see those little rotate arrows if you like them, or if it's a folder, if you wanna show an image, kind of that poster frame for a folder or not, you can turn those on or off, or even the edit badges, you know, those little badges in the corner that tell you if you've edited the photo, or if you've used no noise, or if it's got layers. You know, you could turn a lot of those little adornments off if you don't really care to know what, have that extra information. So yeah. you decide what you want to show on those thumbnails now. Really very powerful, yeah. Something I, I kind of do is, you know, I have, I'll set it up one way for my normal working, but then if I'm gonna show my photos to somebody else, they don't need to see all that other stuff. Yeah, yeah. While I'm showing it, especially on like my secondary display, I'll go in and I'll turn that other stuff off. They don't need to know the star rating that I picked, for example. They just yeah. need to see the photo itself. So I can totally. turn all that jazz off if I don't want it, so. Totally. Cool. Yeah, yeah. So another, you mentioned gestures. Yeah. I wanna see really. the gestures. Yeah, let's do that. So another awesome feature inside of Photo Raw are these gestures. So let's just open up a photo here uh, inside of the edit module. And this is the way I like to use these gestures, especially for masking, because with gestures, you can pinch to zoom and you can pan around the scene just like you would, you know, with your trackpad. So what I'm gonna do in here is just go into the effects tab. I know I've added dynamic contrast a bunch, but <laughs> it's just a really awesome way to add in detail. And what I'm gonna do is just selectively apply this um, with a brush here. Um, but what I'm gonna do is just show you how easy it is to use those gestures while you're selectively masking. So obviously I'm zoomed out. If I wanna zoom in, I don't have to go back to that view tool or that zoom tool. I can just zoom in with my finger and I can also pan around the scene just like that. I wish you guys could see this. I don't, I don't have like a camera on the, on the trackpad for this, but these are the same gestures that you'd use on a trackpad or on a touch screen or if you're using a, like a tablet before, it's the same idea. So, you know, it's two fingers to drag the foot around to pan it. You can use the pinch and spread gesture to zoom in and pan the photo. There's also other things, like if you swipe with two fingers, it'll change photos. It'll go to the next photo or the previous photo. Or if you're in browse and you wanna change the thumbnail size, you can use that same pinch gesture to change the size of the thumbnails in the grid view as well. So it's very handy. Now you're probably asking, what are the things that you actually need to use this? So on a Mac, you just need to have a touchpad. So if you're using a trackpad. laptop or trackpad, yeah. If you have a trackpad built on your laptop on a Mac, that will work. Or if you have an external trackpad surface like Magic that. Mouse. Like a or magic track track pad. Pad. Yeah, yeah. magic trackpad. Yeah, yeah. Regardless, like, <laughs> I think I think it works on the mouse. Yeah, I think it was. The, yeah, I'm going to try that yeah. myself. Uh, on Windows right now, you'll need to have a touch sensitive screen. So if you're using a tablet, uh, Windows tablet machine, or one of the ones those laptops you can kind of fold in half, you know, yep. you can use your fingers to do those gestures on there. We're working on adding gesture support for the little Windows trackpads on little Windows laptops. Oh, nice. That's a little bit different. That'll be coming in a free update in the future as well. So, nice. but if you're a laptop user, it's so much more natural to use that little Very trackpad. Natural. And now, I love it so. when I'm masking. It's like my favorite thing. I don't gotta switch to a different tool. I can just zoom around and pan around. It's awesome. Yeah, it's very handy. So I did mention a couple things on the export dialog. I just wanted to show you how those are also mirrored in places like import. So I'm just gonna jump, oh, I'm just gonna jump over here. I wanna show you guys the import dialog real fast. You'll notice over here on the import dialog, in the destination section, there's that same generate subfolders option. So you can now divide up the photos on import into folders based on whatever criteria you want. If you want to divide them up by date, rather than just being a couple date options like you had in the past, you can divide them up into any format you want or by camera, for example, you name it, you can divide those up. And when it comes to renaming, you have those same powerful renaming options that you had on export. So you can use your own mix of text plus any of those metadata tokens. Nice. So it's not just an export where you get those cool features. And in the standalone batch renaming dialog, you have those same renaming options by token as well. So very handy way to go through and do that. Another awesome new feature inside of Photo Raw is the all new favorites pane, which allows you to drag and drop your favorite folders or frequently visited folders so you can instantly access them. Uh, uh, over here, inside of, inside of Photo Raw here, I'm inside of the Browse module, and I'm just in this Browse tab to the left, and you can see I have this Favorites pane here. This is going to show me these different folders of mine that I can access to find these favorite or frequently looked at images that I'm constantly working on. Another great thing about this Favorites pane, let's say I need to go in here and maybe add in a new folder for those favorites. So this is kind of like a shortcut, right? It just exactly. takes me to that folder. 
Because if you know, kind of look what he's doing right now. In order to find that folder, he has to go find his hard drive. Yeah, exactly. And open up the hard drive and so, go to your user yeah. and go to your photos and go to whatever the subfolder is. And it's a pain to have to constantly do that to find wherever you keep your photos. Exactly. So what I'm going to do here is I can just I'm just going to make a new subfolder just to make it easy. It's going to add a subfolder. Let's name it Pano Images. I'm going to move those images in there, and I'm just going to scroll back up here, and I'm going to drag that right there. And now I can instantly access those pano images if I frequently want to look at them or edit them. And it's just a really, really fast way to always know where those images are stored. Yeah. Are at. And if you kind of look at the breadcrumbs bar at the top, you can see the full path where I started at. You know, started on that, that folder and went through all those other subfolders. And of course, you can navigate through there as mm -hmm. well. So a very quick, handy way to get to the, those frequent places. And that could be on an external drive or a network folder. It doesn't matter anywhere. Yeah. Just the places you get to all the time. Think of it kind of like a catalog folder, but it doesn't have the overhead of actually going through and cataloging that folder. It just takes you right to that place you go yeah. to all the time very quickly and easily. All righty. Well, I think that kind of covers all the big yeah. new features in Photo Raw 2022. There's probably some other little fun tidbits out there that uh, we didn't get a chance to talk about today, but I'm sure you'll find those and tell us about them. Now, uh, one last question I saw was information about system requirements. If you go to the product page, it lists full information about the system requirements for what you're going to need. doesn't change much over last year. I think the only big difference is uh, Mac OS 1013 has been removed. That's just too old at this point. But anything else that's modern, anything in the last five or so years, you're going to have no problem using PhotoRaw 2022 in. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much for watching. We really appreciate it. I hope you saw a bit about the new features and are stoked on the, the latest version of PhotoRaw. We're very excited for you guys to get your hands on it and start playing with it. Yeah, we can't wait for you guys to get your hands on it, give us some feedback, tell us what you love about it. We can't wait to continue to improve it for you. Lots of cool new stuff coming next year as well. All right, thanks for watching, have a great one.